think uh, this seems like such a great Martin Scorsese film, but I know that this project really, uh, really originated a long time ago with your interest in Howard Hughes. So could you talk just about how you first got interested in the subject and then decided to make a film? Well, I, you know, my perception of Howard Hughes had always been um, the older gentleman locked away in the hotel room, the monstrous right. figure, the man with the long fingernails, the long hair, the Kleenex boxes on his feet. And, you know, it, it literally was a situation in which I went to a bookstore and saw a book with this young-looking man with an aviator cap. And it intrigued me, and it said Howard Hughes. And I had no idea Howard Hughes was even an aviator. I knew th nothing about him other than he was, you know, uh, a billionaire germaphobe that isolated himself from the entire world. He was really around in the golden era of cinema and made this film called Hell's Angels, which you saw in the, in the movie. And it was the first multi, you know, million dollar epic of that time. There had been one million dollar movie made during that time and Howard Hughes really established himself as this renegade producer that worked sort of outside of the studio system and that of course intrigued me and then him making The Outlaw one of the most sexually explicit films uh, of that time period, Scarface one of the most violent so he really was this renegade producer then of course all of his achievements with aviation he was America's first billionaire legitimate billionaire in America who was also the great Casanova of his time. So all this information about Howard Hughes, I knew absolutely nothing about. And I just became fascinated that a man could lead, you know, 20 different lifetimes mm -hmm. in one. And, and it, it was all related basically to his obsessiveness ultimately. And the fact that Howard Hughes was a man who had obsessive compulsive disorder. And I believe he challenged himself with these insanely large projects constantly to, in a way, escape from these daily you know rituals that he had with germs and these things that he had to do every day because somebody with obsessive compulsive disorder literally needs to fight these urges to do these things constantly every day of their life 24 hours and I believe he honed all that energy into these immense larger-than-life projects for example making the spruce goose and all these other amazing things that he did so that whole character dynamic completely fascinated me and uh, I brought the, the project then to uh, Michael Mann, and um, he and John Logan made about nine drafts. And then Marty got involved. Michael had just filmed, uh, filmed Ali, so he said, you know, I, I'm kind of biopicked out. Who do you want to bring this to? I was one name on my list. I had just worked with the great Martin Scorsese, and I said, let's bring it to him. I know he would appreciate this time period and a, a character study like this of a man that takes a true emotional arc uh, very seriously and, and, he, and he did. He immediately said yes the next day, I believe. You, knowing this character, this um, Republican, you know, nasty senator, your reaction to hearing, well, what about Alan Alder for this part? Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the story goes like this. <laughs> um, you love this story, right? <laughs> no, I, we were talking about, you know, who, who was going to play Senator Brewster and, you know, there were a list of names and Marty kept coming back to Alan's name, and my immediate reaction, forgive me, was <laughs> this is just the greatest guy in the world. This is Alan Alda. Everyone loves the yeah, of Alan Alda. He's the greatest guy. How is he going to play this, you know, this disgusting, you know, monopolizing, uh, corrupt senator? Marty kept on saying, no, that's exactly why. Is that's what your perception of his is of him? And that was one of the most brilliant pieces of uh, casting choices in the entire film because he is so unbelievable, unbelievably slimy in this film. It's, it's amazing. It makes my skin crawl. I mean, this, I want to reach over that table <laughs> in that sequence where we're talking to each other and just wring his neck. He's so believable and so brilliant in this movie. And it was a very funny thing. And, I, and I, the only other time I talked about this with Leo was one night in a, in a setting like this in, a, a, in, front of, uh, in front of people. And I hadn't asked him this before. And, and, but he knows what I'm going to say tonight. The, the, the time we did the scene at the table, the lunch table, you know, with the fish and yeah. we put the fingerprint on the glass, yeah. they called me to the set. The set was lit. I sat down. Camera's ready. No Leo. So I figure he'll be here in a minute. <laughs> Fifteen minutes go by. I'm still sitting there. It's still lit. <laughs> no Leo. So half an hour goes by. Now I'm starting to think, Leo is doing this deliberately. <laughs> Leo knows I'm supposed to be mad at him in this scene, and he's making sure I'll be furious. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not going to let that get to me. I'm just going to play the scene. 
By the time he got there, I was so mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to him, that when an evening like this, I said, Leo, did you do that deliberately? He said, oh, no, no, he just had trouble getting the mustache on, but that's a good idea. <laughs> It wasn't deliberate. Huh? No, not at all. Well, no. I wasn't really mad at you. Anyway. <laughs> but I got really mad at Howard. <laughs> what we became fascinated with, and we, we shot a lot more than, than is actually in the movie, was here you have this technical genius. This, uh, Howard Hughes really was a technical genius. He, he, he was a genius of what he did in, in aviation and business and all these things. And to watch all that genius, you know, all that energy, then to be focused on the minutia of microscopic germs. And he had these memos that we read, man, that were hours and hours long, that went up to here literally about how his can of soup would be opened, the angle in which the, you know, the paper bag would be delivered when he put his hand in as, so no, and this is a direct quote, so no, so no germs may somehow leap off the person onto me. <laughs> you gotta get that image of germs leaping off of people. <laughs> and then somehow attacking him. <coughs> but it was one of the most frightening depictions of mental illness because he was such a technical genius. And all that genius went into hour-long memos of the, the imaginary rung of germs around the soup can and the way the canisters of film would be delivered so no dust would be you know, corroding them. Or uh, when people open the door to the screening room, they have to wave eight times so no bugs would somehow enter. I mean. It was frightening. So we really became obsessed with that. So we went on and on with Howard, you know, doing these memos and talking in voiceover over all, a lot of these images. Did you find yourself repeating things after those <laughs> scenes? Oh, yeah. I mean, did, I mean, did any of it carry over for a little bit? Well, you know, <laughs> I, can, I have stories. <laughs> I mean, <it's>, well, <laughs> people think that actors become the characters, and that's usually not true, but sometimes the experience is so... Uh, uh, so intense mm -hmm. that it that it it does uh, change the, your the, little bit. The obsessive compulsive stuff, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I had you know I had things you know we all have things that we do you know that are obsessive, and um, so for me um, I, I reverted back to my childhood because there's literally a, 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 a when you're a child you do a lot more of these things than you do as an adult because it. And when you're an adult, the logical part of your mind comes and says, this is absolutely unnecessary and ridiculous. I don't need to step on every single crack, you know, or, you know, the plane isn't going to crash if I don't step on this or, you know, do you, scratch my do head you, for do you do when, you, when you're in a car and you're passing telephone poles, do you do anything with the telephone pole? Why, do you? Yeah, I click. <laughs> I thought so. I click before the pole and after the pole. <laughs> what does that mean, click? <laughs> I, go, I, go, I, go, I go click, click, like that, you know. Oh, you say click out loud? No, I don't say it. No, what? <laughs> what like, like, that would be crazy. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm really lucky I didn't play his part. <laughs> Every time I do a movie, it's really hard to distance yourself from thinking about what actually happened that day. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yes, I mean? Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I remember working with my first director uh, for This Boy's Life, and he said, you know, Leonardo, you can't really watch a movie that you've done and appreciate it for what it is for at least five years. Because you have to get the, you have to sort of erase the memories that immediately happen after you make a movie. So you can't really look at the movie objectively, yeah. in other words. Uh, but I don't know, I, I, just for me it's literally become a, it's, it's been a dream come true to see this movie and think about this character and see the development process over eight years and watch what John Logan did with the script and wonder if, if a character like this, like Howard Hughes, could all could it all be sympathetic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Could could draw an audience in and have the audience be in his innermost journeys and in his innermost thoughts and his paranoia and still, you know, relate to this man. And I, that's a testament to uh, all the development that was put in beforehand with John and and, and Michael and what they did, and certainly Marty. It was, it was, it's, the Manchurian Candidate took something like 10 years to develop. And this is one of those situations where it was like 10 years of thought that was put into this movie. And then to finally see it up on screen is, is, it's an amazing gift.